Hello and welcome back to Cloud with Chris. You're with me, Chris Reddington, and we'll be talking about all things cloud. Now in this episode, we get back to a requirements-based topic and an area that will significantly impact the design of our resulting solution architecture. That topic is security. It's one of the hot topics that organizations want to discuss when moving to the cloud. So I'm pleased to be joined in this episode by another colleague, Andrew Nathan, who has a wealth of knowledge in the cybersecurity space. There's plenty to digest in this one, so let's waste no time and jump straight in. Here we go. Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of Cloud with Chris. Now we're once again taking a slightly different route in this session and we're going to be focusing on Azure security. When you think about cloud, one of the common questions that comes up is how do I secure that application? How do I secure that infrastructure? And what are the tools and what are the things out there that I should really be thinking about? What are those patterns? What are those practices? And how do I make sure that I'm not going to be, you know, on the front page of that newspaper because I've uh, leaked a load of my customer information, for example. So joining me today uh, is another colleague of mine, Andrew Nathan, who uh, hails all the way from Australia. So we've covered, I think, pretty much a good number of the world at this stage in terms of continents. And uh, Andrew's focus uh, is all around cybersecurity and uh, more recently within uh, the Fast Track for Azure team uh, on the Azure security side of things as well. So I'm very happy to introduce Andrew. Hi, Chris. Thanks for having me. No, thank you for joining. Thank you so much for joining. Maybe let's start at the very beginning and uh, think about security all up. I guess security is a broad um, a broad idea or a broad area. When yep. an organization starts talking to you about security, where do you kind of start the discussion? I think for me personally, I, I try and start at that high level architecture type level, like a, a security architect. And I try and talk to them about all the practices and procedures and things like that, that they would have in place um, and try and sort of garner a little bit of information about how they do things on prem uh, mm. or how they've done things on prem and try and build on that because there's obviously a lot of parallels, like in terms of the you know the infrastructure and the networking and those sorts of things like there's there's the same sort of bits and pieces but obviously there's a few more threat vectors this time um as they go to the cloud and a little bit more exposure with the you know by virtue of being on the internet so it's more about uh talking to them about that and trying to build that bigger picture and then understand what their business priorities are as well um, because that can help us build the picture of from a security perspective, what it is that's the high value asset, who the high value identities are and those sorts of things. So we can start building the appropriate alerting and whatever else that we need to do for them. Man, there's so many things in there that I want to dive into from what you just said. Yeah, sure. Uh, let's <laughs> maybe start with that idea that we're moving from potentially on-premises, it might even be another cloud, but mm -hmm. let's just think about the uh, the on-premises scenario to cloud first, because I guess it's a whole new area, a whole new domain that people are really starting to go and deploy into and build onto. And it, like you said, you're building on the internet. And I think that's one of the key differences. So what do you see maybe as common themes and trends and maybe those initial thoughts that organizations go through and how they can start maybe um strengthening their posture when they start that initial move let's say what could they use in the toolbox for me the, the first thing that i always recommend is turning on security center i know we're probably diving into this earlier than <laughs> we plan to but I, I can't stress it enough for my customers particularly you know where we sit in how we're helping customers on board and generally you know relatively quickly uh, security center gives them a little bit of oversight uh, because, you know, I think we refer to it sort of commonly as our um, cloud workload uh, protection platform or our cloud security posture management platform. So it helps customers have that insight and to things that they might not necessarily be aware of that they've left themselves potentially misconfigured and then available to those potential threat vectors. And I guess building on top of that, we then sort of have to explain to the customers like the different sort of 
uh, pillars of threats that they're then, a, a, for lack of a better word, um, that they're exposed to now going to the cloud, whether it's the tenant level stuff or the, I guess, depending who you talk to in the team, whether it's control plane or management plane, like having those like global administrator credentials exposed if they're not secured properly, um, you know, not using MFA, those types of things through to the, you know, other subscription level things like accounts, external accounts being added or stale access. And, and that's probably one of the big things and we'll probably touch on it a little bit later is, you know, identity is still a huge part of uh, everybody's or it should be a huge part of everybody's focus uh, with it being, you know, the new perimeter for, from a security perspective. But there's still so many like stale uh, credentials out there or people that just haven't had their access revoked. So we start, I generally try and start the conversation there, like turn security center at a minimum on, get an insight into what you've deployed and what's potentially misconfigured. Um, and then, you know, start planning for identity at the forefront. Like how are we going to secure this? How, you know, what's our plan for worst case scenario, something that's compromised there at that control plane? Uh, how are we going to, plan to get that control back and a lot of it i suppose as well from that identity perspective is is understanding the difference between azure ad and azure rbac which a lot of customers don't understand unfortunately and it's probably not implemented properly so it's a lot of conversations and i guess trying to dial them back from turning everything on and turning everything up to 11 and let's just get everything up here to trying to have like a strategic okay you know, let's deploy these types of identities first, give them access, make sure it works, does what we need it to do and and build on top of it from there. I think what it demonstrates is just that broad, uh, broad topic that we've got, right? I think we talked about yeah. a bit about security center, uh, a bit about identity, and then starting to think about really that initial journey and how you uh, how you build up that uh, that environment, I guess. Um, yeah, I think from like a security perspective, sorry to, to interrupt, but I think we find that a lot of customers like the, and it's always been, there's, and to use a, a military term, like the, like a beachhead established, like there's always been some sort of project, some reason that they've gone to the cloud. And it tends to be mm-hmm. that part of the organization that's established whatever all of their processes and practices are, whether that's a developer going out there and, and spinning up an app in the cloud or an infrastructure team building some IaaS machines and and creating some sort of, you know, little environment. And it's like, we didn't understand what we were doing when we got up here and we turned the bare minimum things on to make what we needed to do work. Um, And now we're at this place where everybody's following us. So we need to regain that control. Um, And that's when we tend to find, okay, well, we have to like remediate a little bit and sort of step back and, it's not, not essentially like not really starting again, but it's like, let's like course correct and make sure that from now on, everything that goes on is, is a little bit more secure and auditable and all those sorts of things. And I'm going to start waving my DevOps flag at this point, because this <laughs> is really that nature of being able to iterate over things. You know, we've got our minimum yeah. viable product, we've got it working awesome. Uh, but now actually, like you say, we need to take it to that next level. We need to be able to start securing against some of those potential threats. And I think that's that's one of the things coming from my uh, previous experience as well um, that I think is a, a really worthwhile activity is thinking about threat mm-hmm. modeling and thinking about, you know, what are we actually trying to protect against? I've worked with some organizations where they come along and say, you know, we need to secure our application. Okay. Mm-hmm. What does that mean to you, though, (laughs) is that first question, isn't it? And it's all about those requirements and trying to just pick apart what exactly that means. Yeah, and I think in uh, I try, I tend to go a little bit too deep when those kinds of questions get asked because I start going to them, okay, mm-hmm. you know, well, the industry that you're in, these are the advanced persistent threats that we see typically in this region that are trying to access these sorts of things. So are you aware of that? And then um, I think sometimes I force customers to pull handbrakes on because <laughs> they realize that they're not really prepared. <laughs> Gotcha. But that's some of that cybersecurity background coming in, I guess, there. So uh, valid yeah. experience, I think. Valid experience. Yeah. So if we maybe think, you know, put ourselves in the shoes of a customer and put ourselves through that journey. So we're at that stage where um, maybe they've got that minimum viable product. They mm-hmm. need to start fleshing out some of those security requirements, let's say. Uh, how 
do you typically see them starting off? What are some of the things that they should start putting in their minds when they're new to this cloud world? I guess we've talked about identity as one of those things. Are there maybe mm -hmm. other common maybe pitfalls or tips and tricks that you see on those initial stages, for example? So I'll, I'll probably keep bringing it up because I think it's the easiest win for our customers it is Security Center, really. Um, because I guess the, I'm sure you were there when we had that talk from the the uh, red team, our cybersecurity offensive capability in um, Redmond last year. Um, and that was a fantastic conversation, but he highlighted to us that still the, the you know, the top two um, threat vectors really are, are still number one identity, whether it's your admins, your devs, or your op staff, because they can be compromised. They're still in, inside of threats and, um, you know, style credentials and all those sorts of things. So that's always a big focus and, and understanding, talking to customers about what their strategy is for their identity um, and, you know, how you're onboarding customers, how you're onboarding partners, because that's an, another big thing and another bit potential vector that we've got for them there. Because as we've gone to the cloud now, there's so many more customers that you, you know, trusting a, a partner to do it for them. Um, but then the rest of it is, is generally like the, the next thing down for a threat vector is misconfiguration. Um, and that's where obviously Security Center really helps the customers because it, it calls it out for you and says, you know, this port's available. You're, you're accepting traffic here or you're not, you don't have, don't have encryption, uh, you know, between your storage account and, and those sorts of things. So it, it highlights those things that they might not have missed. And, and you know, the application's working Um everything's doing everything that it needs to do or the you know the vms are talking to each other whatever the case may be but there's still these things in there that if they don't harden that sort of stuff up they're going to miss out or, or you know potentially be compromised and i guess as we go like talk to the customers about it we you know and you start sort of okay uh, and i guess like you were saying with your, your devops background right like starting to talk to customers then okay if you've got an application well what's your your data life cycle then like if you're creating your data um, and then you're storing it and you're using it and you're sharing it that, that's great but where's it being stored like how you're auditing it who's got permission to it like where are you doing all those sorts of things and i find that like that's what I, if we i guess back to the my original point a, a lot of my conversations are really around the, the, the strategy and high level conversations about like you because if the customers don't understand what their strategy is if they don't understand how the component talk to each other and all those sorts of things going to the cloud then they can't adequately protect it um, so it's really just turn security center on see what we're picking up that you've potentially misconfigured use that as your quick wins like assign some kpis for the bigger ones and and you know send that to your change control board if you need to but then start ticking off some of the quicker wins like you know we've got a, cl a quick fix button go and click a couple of those and turn on your secure um, communications and turn on your just-in-time vm access and those sorts of things and, and get those quick wins and, and harden up those little bits and then we can build on the bigger stuff from there and, and help you whether it's developing a devsecops sort of platform and you know iterating on that sort of stuff and hardening up and using the right sdks or you know, understanding the, the OWASP top 10 or the treacherous 12, whatever it might be that you need to, uh, to protect against in your environment. But, you know, start putting the things in place, talking to the right people in your organization. Because I guess back to that point about it being like a beachhead or a one initial team that deals with it. It's like you get the relevant stakeholders, like everybody that's going to have a say in what you, you need to do and what you need to harden up. And, and let's get uh, the bigger picture for your organization. Because if you're going to the, going to the cloud now, hopefully you're going to be staying here so this is going to become your new normal so let's set the parameters and, and the guidelines and the framework and and really harden it all up for you so i'm gonna uh, put a phrase in that we've used in previous episodes which is this idea of failing to plan planning to fail and so much of what yeah. you said there is about having that right context isn't it being able to understand hmm. who are those potential threat actors or malicious actors what are the vectors mm -hmm. they're going to potentially use to your point there might be people internally, for example, who come in and try and just sabotage what we're doing. There may be even accidental things like misconfiguration or potentially intentional as well. You you don't know the motive, you don't know the intent, and there could be any number of reasons. And ultimately, what you need to start thinking about is, you know, what are those crown jewels? What are the things that you really want to protect? And what are the things that are not so valuable, let's say, because 
there's always a trade off with applying some of these uh, some of these procedures and some of these policies, right? And there's a yep. potentially a management overhead. There's the potential uh, how do I word this? The potential um, trade offs that you might have from an application perspective, for example, as well. Like going really deep in the specific for a sec. If you think about Kubernetes and uh, some mm-hmm. of the things you can do to lock down the underlying uh, kernel and what can be done there, for example. Yep. Sure, you can do that, but if you're compromising what the application has to do, obviously that's that that's then a trade-off based on the requirements. So how often do you see customers thinking with that requirements-first driven mindset, I suppose? I'll be honest, like it generally, it depends on the industry. I find that the, the finance industry tend to be... Uh, in in my customers, definitely down here in in the Asia Pacific region, they're very focused on like we have these requirements that we need to meet first. So we can't really go forward with anything else until we can figure out how to tick these boxes. Uh, so we have lots of conversations with them about you know setting things up so they can justify that they've met those particular requirements. And obviously, then the next become state and federal governments. Um, they're Mm, I would say, <laughs> depending on the organisation, um, they're either very regulation focused, or we've had a couple of organisations that are like, well, if it's just going to be too hard, well, then we'll just accept the risk and we'll work around it, um, <laughs> which is uh, concerning in, in some aspects. And then the rest, it really depends on. I think where they're going to be operating and we found re- more recently particularly in you know the the climate that we're currently in with people working from home and those sorts of things I've found that I'm having a lot more GDPR conversations around those types of regulations and stuff because there's now you know remote workforces and and whatnot accessing stuff uh, in in the European region so we need to start talking to customers about those sorts of things. And I think that's been a little bit of an eye opener for those customers who are like, yeah, all right, well, you know, we need to start reporting against this stuff. And then when you start talking to them about what that actually means and having um, the right people in the right positions for reporting purposes and, you know, data owners and maintainers and and all those sorts of things. And Mm -hmm. they start thinking, well, we're, you know, (laughs) we're woefully underprepared for what we need to do and how we need to report and who's going to be on the hook for this sort of stuff. Because, you know, it's not a particular GDPR. It's not a trivial thing um, that they have to to, be exposed to, you know, if they have that breach. Yeah. I, Trying to digest everything that we've talked about the, the, the <laughs> past few past few sentences back and forth. I think yeah. there's initially that piece to understand who your threat actors are, uh, be mm-hmm. able to model that and understand what your vectors are, translating that into requirements and that wider strategy. Also taking into account what those wider compliance pieces that you might need to go and adhere to, and from yep. there being able to start converting that then into some kind of plan and you know, taking that DevOps and DevSecOps kind of mindset, it's not necessarily mm-hmm. you need to boil the ocean all at once, but you start iterating no. over and start pulling those different services in and baking some of those requirements into your uh, planning cycle and into your development cycle and building out that infrastructure then as well is kind of the model mm-hmm. that I'm hearing unfold there. Yeah, and I guess like, and I don't, I'm assuming your customers are, are similar to mine, Um is that you know we're I'm predominantly dealing with customers that don't really even have a dedicated security team. Mm. So they're like, yeah, cool. Like, what can we do, and how can we turn things on now to just secure stuff? And I guess there's that mindset or the misconception that just going to the cloud because you know parts of well, ma- you know, majority of Azure is is at a protected level, for example, for Australian customers, and then we've got the yes. FedGov cloud for the US guys and those sorts of things. And there's I guess somewhat of an assumption that we're secure by default and then, you know, you've got to have that conversation about that shared responsibility model and the fact that they still, they're always going to own their own data. They're always going to own their own identities uh, and those particular parts of it. So it's understanding those bits, but then like you were saying, it's then it becomes iterating. Like I, I said to these customers, like just, you can't just turn everything on and, and be secure. Um, you, mm-hmm. This is going to be a journey. So let's start you on the journey and get you, a, you know, some awareness to what's happening in your environment. But then this is going to be a maturing capability for you. And as you grow and as, as your experience with 
you know the the potential threats or um, misconfigurations or whatever the case may be you know like whatever exposes you um, and then you grow that experience and then I think you know obviously the, the goal of most security people is to get it to a point where the responses to those things are you know automated responses so you know a mm -hmm. bit of that if this and that like top logic uh, you know and we've got playbooks and, and logic apps and those sorts of things that customers can create to take those programmatic actions uh, and then it's about you know iterating and eventually down the track it's it's that whole maturity model of you know you're ingesting threat intelligence feeds that uh, are based on you know, those threats that are they're out there and those threats that are interested in you because it, fundamentally from a security perspective if they're interested in you then you should be interested in them you should understand what their um, the, the military term or the cyber security term that we use is uh, tactics techniques and procedures like ttps um, what they are because most of them they're similar to our organizations that you know the, the upstanding ones that they have a, a, a typical way that they do things you know they'll try and ddos or they'll um you know brute force until they get a, a, a credential and then it's lateral movement and then from there what is it like what do they want to do are they exfiltrating your data or is it just a persistent presence because the three most active ones that we have down here in southeast asia the the most common thing that they want to do is they just want to persist in your environment. There's no evidence that they're actually exfiltrating the data or anything like that. Um, so it's, you know, having the awareness that that's what those behaviors are. So that's, that's the type of thing that we need to be detecting against. And, you know, it's, it's not a, it's not something that you're just going to turn on and, and be aware of from day one, you have to build that experience. And like I said, it's a journey. Absolutely. And uh, I've been sat here just listening and thinking of some of my own customers where I've almost, uh, you know, one of our colleagues, Cam, uh, he, when we spoke <laughs> quite a while ago, um, yep. we were talking about this whole DevOps mindset of, oh, you know, as if you're rocking up to your favorite uh, fast food restaurant and saying, oh, can I have a DevOps with that, please? And that concept yeah. of DevOps. And it's the same idea with security, isn't it? Oh, can I have security yeah. on top of that as well, please? Yeah. One security, please. Exactly, yeah. exactly. I'll have two security centers and a sentinel, thanks. <laughs> exactly. And it's really yeah. understanding the workload and what your place is within the industry and what uh, what potentially people are going to try and attack you for. Because, you know, Microsoft, for example, or Google or Amazon or any of those big cloud vendors are obviously quite big targets given mm -hmm. the nature of the industries they span across, the fact that they have you know, these sizable uh, cloud deployments, for example, they're going to be attack vectors for a number of different reasons. And, yeah, you know, that's, right. that's going to be very different to like a financial customer, to your point earlier, or a manufacturing mm. or whatever it may be. Um, yeah. So understanding that, is it a foreign intelligence and like another government or something like that? Or is it going to be mm -hmm. a potential competitor or just, um, you know, the script kid who is in their basements, you know, coding away mm -hmm. just to get rid of their time whilst they're in COVID-19 mode, for example. It's a number of different uh, potential threats there could be. So, yeah, super, super interesting discussion. I think we've we've definitely highlighted that fact i think that it's not just about yeah. turning everything on and hoping for the best you really need to understand the domain that you're working in there yeah exactly so then i guess we've skirted around it a couple of times maybe let's jump into it a little bit more i guess we've mentioned azure security center a few times so mm -hmm. i think azure security center has evolved a lot over the past few years when i think about what it was maybe a couple of years ago to where it is now it's had so mm -hmm. much investment in it it really has yeah maybe talk us through what you see as the common trends and themes that you find you're talking about with the security center these days and what kind of excites you with customers going on that journey maybe yeah um it is exciting like to see how it's changed like i started working with it probably two and a half three years ago now and it's certainly very different now to what it was then and i guess a lot of that's virtue of you know us bringing sentinel in and, and having that as our security information and event management tool and you know, a lot of the data ingestion but the, I, to be perfectly honest like security center is one of my favorite products in the cloud purely because of the insight that it gives our customers and the the secure score and the recommendations it's really just taking that guesswork out of it and it and it's super beneficial for those companies and and those organizations that are small that don't have that dedicated security team because they can deploy those things and and whatever else they need to do 
Um, however, you know, they're comfortable with doing and then the tool's going to run under the hood for them and go, hey, here are these recommendations, here are the things that you need to harden up. So, you know, they don't need to necessarily be aware from day one what they need to harden up, but they they really need to be aware from that from that in what they can do to then remediate the things that they have deployed to fix them up and harden them up. And I think that's like seeing customers go on that journey and, and like just like you know if you're on a video call with them or, or whatever the case may be and you can see them sort of clicking along as I'm doing the demo mm. and you just see their face light up like oh wow we didn't even know this was here and then <laughs> uh, if the customers have got like the standard tier turned on and then they can play around with you know like the advanced the, the application controls you know the, the app yeah. whitelisting and those sorts of bits and I don't know if you've spent any time trying to create whitelisting policies, but uh, it's mm. time consuming. And for the machine learning part of it, to give it to them just, you know, by grouping them together by like application and those sorts of things and go, hey, here's your, your path and your publisher rules. Off you mm. go. And then you've you just got this, you know, it takes two to three weeks for it to run in the background. And then all of a sudden they've got that policy there that they can just hit go and just start auditing the environment and seeing who's using what and nice. where and building that picture, which... You know, like obviously, <laughs> a lot of companies or organisations sort of aren't really doing that sort of stuff. Um, and mm -hmm. so, for them to have that insight, and then, you know, the other the other part of that that I really like, aside, you know, the just in time stuff is, is cool too. But the the change control, like that file integrity monitoring part of it, um, mm -hmm. that's fantastic as well. Because again, like a lot of those, well, the defaults that we've got in there are for the the whole credential theft thing, right? So. Yeah. If those things are changed or, or potentially modified, that it's going to indicate that there's potential um, credential theft or, or, you know, lateral movement occurring within your environment. So you're going to get those alerts, which, you know, the average customer doesn't have that insight. And I think uh, I haven't looked at the figures in a while, but it used to take sort of between 24 to 48 hours for from initial compromise to your domain admin credentials being taken. And then the average, when I used to deliver the workshop, it was like 240 days that uh, the the attackers were <laughs> live in your environment before you uh, detected them. So to have mm -hmm. a tool that's sort of doing it for you in the background, um, just by virtue of paying sort of, you know, $15 or whatever it is a month is, is you know, you can't really put a price on it, right? Like if you're paying a couple of hundred dollars a month to have that kind of level of oversight in your environment as opposed to paying you know hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars uh to to tidy it back up after an event Indeed. Indeed. um it, it's you know like just those little things i can like the customer all the customers have to do is turn the service on and install an agent and it starts doing that for them do you know what i mean yeah. Yeah, like from yeah. like I, i've been part of like compromised recovery efforts and those sorts of things and they're like they're exhausting trying to correlate all those data all that data and, and pull it together and you know the, the last one i did there was a team of like 30 odd people that had spent 108 hours trying to go through wow. an event by the time i got called in and then we did like another 40 plus hours on top of that so to to be able to like and they had no idea that you know it was a, a malicious insider it was you know some credential stuff had happened and if they'd had a tool like this that was like hey this has been changed like that's that's bad You're like oh, okay yeah great well, let's start could have quite easily accelerated that yeah yeah instead of you know yeah instead of spending like two and a half weeks worth of effort trying to Man. like get it back on to on track and figure out who actually did it um, yeah. So to, those are the wow. bits that, that excite me. Um, and the, just mm. the fact that, again, those recommendations, like that secure score, gives you a way to track it. Like, I don't know if you were you a premier field engineer or a consultant before Fast Track. Like uh, I, was, I was an ADM, so a bit of right. a hybrid. <laughs> sure. So I was, I was a security PFE, and we used to get like paid to, to go in, or customers would pay for us to go in, and, and we'd run these security assessments for them. And at the end of the week, we'd give them this you know, 85 mm. page Word document with here's your list of criticals and highs. And we'd go, you know, spend an hour going through what we thought were the most critical and the most high in a, in a PowerPoint presentation, and then we'd leave them with it. Um, and they'd, you know, we'd go back 12 months later to run the same assessment and they'd be like, yeah, we haven't done anything because we couldn't figure out what was the most critical or what was the most high. We couldn't prioritize for mm -hmm. it. And now Security Center gives them the, the weighted scores and it's like, okay, these things, you know, it's changed a little bit now, but it's like, here's, you fix these things and it's going to add 11% to your score. Like, oh, great. Yeah. Cool. That gets me above 50%. That's happy days. 
um, you know, fix the next thing, that gives me another like, you know, eight, 10, 11%, whatever it is, that gets me above 70 or above 60. Um, and you can, you know, you can iterate it and you can see what things are being completed and what remediation steps you're, you're taking. So it's not this like invisible thing that's just happening in the background anymore. It's like this tool that actually helps you get that insight into, you know, what did we have that was misconfigured and, and what have we fixed and, and where are we going? You can actually see it improve, which I think for a lot of businesses is going to be or should be a game changer, really, to have that level of insight that they've never had before. Yeah, yeah. And I think the theme that I'm hearing here when I think about the things that you've just talked about with Azure Security Center, with like machine learning baked in, you know, those capabilities of being able to stitch together the fact that brute force attempt fail, brute force attempt fail, brute force attempt, mm -hmm. you know, get in, suddenly there's some movement happening, some things start happening and you can start piecing all that together. Um, this idea of secure score, uh, the idea of like a red team and a blue team, really mm -hmm. what this is all hinting to me from the outside is thinking about this evolution of the role of security. I think always it was this, to one of your points a bit earlier, this kind of t tick box or checkbox exercise where, yep, we've gone ahead and we have uh, secured the network boundaries. Awesome. <laughs> yep. We rotate our certificates and our passwords every so often. Awesome. But that's <laughs> yeah. now like the bare minimum to yeah, expect, exactly. right? Because to your point a, a bit earlier in the discussion here, the network boundary is not really the boundary these days that people really care about. It's the identity <laughs> not boundary. Not at all. Yeah. And if I were a bad actor, that is the first thing I would go after. I would go after someone's account because I'd rely on the fact to your point earlier, there would be someone who's probably an admin, shouldn't be an admin, doesn't have multi-factor authentication, and mm -hmm. I've suddenly got the keys to the kingdom. It was yep. that indirect route, isn't it? And mm -hmm. I think all of these tools that you mentioned and these kind of components and this idea of ML being able to come in and, and help address that um, are absolutely super. But I, one of the things I really love is just that red team, blue team concept. And I don't see enough organizations doing that kind of activity, those wargaming kind of scenarios. Oh, absolutely not. And I think that's really where I try and sort of like build my customers towards and I think back to what we were talking about before in terms of you know like threat modeling and testing your application and understanding who's trying to get in um, to get to your stuff and I said to my customers like you know this is this is the start and and blue team is generally where it starts right like it's we we want to yeah. harden things and we want to protect our stuff and we want to patch and we want to do all the good things great once you've got that and you understand and, and everything you're comfortable the next iteration of that really is you know let's do those penetration testing and and that red team type stuff and make sure that our you know our environment is secure and that we have you know hardened up the the right things and that we're aware of you know the the things that we haven't secured like is our source code public like are we using trusted libraries for our applications and you know do, what you were saying before you know like a single factor authentication like do we have multi-factor turned on are we using the same account for our dev work as we are for um, you know, in our dev environment that we are for our, our normal environment. And, uh, you know, is there a large group of people that have all these permissions and those sorts of things? Look, let's test it. Let's make sure that all the things and controls that we've put in place, we, we've, we have hardened that. And, you know, obviously there's, there's no panacea, there's no perfect thing that's going to stop everything, but do we have the right mitigations in place? Do we have the enough depth that if, that one thing is compromised, are there protections in place to stop it at the next level? And are we alerting that that it's happened? So, you know, we can, you know, we'll have a little bit of a purple team, I guess, like a, a blue team that's then offensively trying to turn things off, like put machines into network security groups that are isolated so that there's no inbound or outbound traffic anymore. Um, you know, mm. taking those types of steps and, um, and you, you can probably tell like how animated I've got over the last <laughs> 15 <laughs> minutes or so that's like really like is, is my passion and, and why I love coming to work yeah. every day because I get to have these kinds of conversations and help these customers like just open their eyes and like, yeah, wow, like we can do this now. Like security is not this big. Uh, mysterious beast that we're not aware of and you know that everyone goes into a dark room and just has secret handshakes and does all this stuff like it's <laughs> you know we would i'm i see my job as like breaking that barrier and helping customers understand that you know the typical it operations type stuff that they do every day is part of that blue team stuff like your patching and all that sort of thing so let's 
build on that. Yeah, and there's definitely this theme of modernizing security, isn't there? And I've been doing a bit of um, you know work and ramping and learning in the IoT space as well. Mm-hmm. Definitely won't cover that in any depth in this session <laughs> because I'm sure that's what we could talk in a ton of depth. But yeah, one of the things from something I was um, reading recently and really struck me and it's kind of obvious when you think about it but you're just reading it kind of written down there that your security is only as good as what you know about today and Mm -hmm. the next vulnerability that comes out tomorrow or the next big security evolution and big kind of threat vector or you know attack mechanism or however you want to call it comes out tomorrow you haven't planned for that because you didn't know about that and that's not a failing necessarily on anyone it's just the nature of this kind of evolving technical world that we live in. And I think it really comes back to that point of what worked a while ago with just, you know, certificate rotations and that network boundary. (laughs) We're living in a different world and we need to bring that agile kind of mindset and being willing to keep evolving our security practices is, is really what I'm learning from the discussion here at least. Yeah, absolutely. Um, It's funny, an analogy I used to use, but I, um, I got in trouble for using it was that, um, being a like a, a security professional and trying to protect your network is a lot like um, being the father of daughters. Like, you know, that old saying, like, if you've got a son, you've only got to worry about one son. But if you've got a daughter, you've got to worry about all of them. <laughs> and I liken that to being in security, right? Like the, the threat actors, they know what their target is. And, you know, if it's your business, then they can be single minded in attacking your business. But like I was saying before, in Southeast Asia, there's three main uh, advanced persistent threat groups or APTs that, that we have in in the environment. So, you know, you've got to worry about all of them. Like you can't just worry about one of them because they might use your organization as a pivot to something else. Um, so you have to protect against all of them and understand, you know, like we were saying all before, you know, where you sit in the, in the, in the food chain and, you know, what you've got out there and, and the skin that you have in the game and, and making sure mm-hmm. like, that, that you are taking the, the necessary steps and it's you know it can be daunting um but at the same time i don't know for me it, that whole it's like a challenge i think and and to your point like it's going to be evolving as we add new services to the platform and um, you know consumers want to take things and, and want to use things certain ways and, and we have to adapt and change and, and give the to them like that we're just we're going to keep opening ourselves to potential threats so iot is obviously a huge one um and it's mm. just a matter of you know, getting to, we're always going to be chasing that tail. No secure, like we were saying before, like the, you're never going to be a hundred percent secure, but it's just about understanding where you are um, and what your potential risks are and, and being the, that awareness piece is, is huge. Um, mm. Really. Like it, if you know what risks you've got and then you can be calculated about it you can make your, your risk assessments and you can, you know, mitigate what you can, and then there's always going to be some residual risk like that. And that, I think that's the, the most confronting conversation that we always have to have is that you're never going to have zero risk and understanding that and planning for it and knowing where the hole is and, and being able to watch for it to make sure it's not leaking or if it is leaking that, you know, it doesn't become a river is the, is the part of the challenge. And, and everyone just has to be aware that it's going to, and particularly now being on the internet and going to the cloud, but <laughs> it's always going to be changing. Got it. So if I start wrapping us up, one question before mm. I go to my final question, I guess. Uh, we've <laughs> talked about Azure Security Center, but there's also yep. this other service that you briefly touched upon, and it might just be worth giving a quick um, quick summary of what it is, just in case anyone doesn't know, because I guess it's it's a fairly new service in the context of Azure. I know there's things coming out all the time. This one's fairly yep. newish, I'll say, uh, and that's Azure Sentinel. So mm-hmm. um how does Azure Sentinel fit into everything we've spoken about there, I guess? Yeah, so I guess like for, for people playing at home that might not necessarily be aware, so it, it's a, a same, um, so the security information and event management tool. So it, it's a place for you to ingest all your security logs from multiple sources, whether it's your um, Cisco ASAs or your, your Fortinets or your whatever the case may be. Like we've got connectors to everything. I always laugh that the first connector that shows up in the portal is AWS just because it's alphabetical, nothing else, nothing else there. Um, and it's mm. purely for you to ingest your data from a security perspective for you to be able to build your visualization. And I guess to the points that we we're making in, earlier in um, in the in the conversation is, is around just being aware of your data and 
um, where it's going and, and all those sorts of things. And that's the whole point of it. Um, there's some amazing visualizations and what we call workbooks built into it, which for me, I don't know if you've played around with any in the past, but I've played with some of them. Um, and that whole getting to a point where you can actually visualize your data is is the biggest effort for, for all of that stuff. Like all of them are great at ingesting data. Like ours is fantastic. Like you link it to your log analytics workspace, happy days. We'll, we'll take whatever data you can send us. Um, and then it's... That those visualizations that we've the, the the product group and in consultation with our red teams and our blue teams have built the visualizations for customers to be able to go okay cool like here's your information and here's what we think is relevant and important for you to look at whether it's your azure activity or your, your azure ad your, and all those sorts of things your 0365 here's some common um, things that we think you should be looking at and then from there you can build your alerting out and have Pardon me, your alerts built around, you know, whatever's important to you as a business, um, whether it's you, you know, pre specific servers, IPs, addresses, uh, mailboxes and identities. And I probably that's probably something that I haven't really touched on um, much, but it's a conversation that I particularly have with my customers that want to use Sentinel is around who are your VIP identity identities, not just your, your admins, but your, your VIPs, like the people who by virtue of their role, are going to be allowed to access whatever they want you know those c-level executives like let's let's create some visualizations around what they're doing like when are they logging on um, and all those sorts of things let's get an idea of what normal looks like for them so if they start doing things outside of that logging in at three o'clock on a saturday morning or something like that we're alerted to it and you can build a you know those visualizations in sentinel and that and then from there build your alerts so you'll be notified if that happens and then you can take it's also got um a saw capability so security like orchestration and automation or automated response built into it so thinking about those logic apps that we we're talking about before you can create you know log a ticket and service now or whatever sort of other itsm platform that you might have or like i was saying before take that programmatic action and put it into a network security group or whatever the case may be and you know really build it out from there um, and it, it's a fantastic product. It's it's maturing like it's so much change has, has occurred with it over the last sort of twelve months, and they're adding so much more stuff to it, like the ability to you know potentially sandbox and all those sorts of things, um, is is phenomenal. And for the fact that it's like baked into the platform, it, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. I love playing around with it. I love demonstrating it. Um, but we probably don't have enough time for me to keep deep deep diving into my fanboy status. <laughs> but we can uh, definitely pull uh, pull another episode together to talk about all that because yeah, uh, for sure. you know, I completely agree. I think it's I th everything we've talked about, right? Really, that theme of observability, being able to yep. understand what is actually going on, is so so important. Not just from security, but in general monitoring. And mm -hmm. you know, I think that's uh, Sentinel's a key player in that. So just to wrap us up here, um, maybe if we think about everything that we've talked about which has been quite a lot we've been on quite a journey i think in this episode yep. what would you see may maybe are those couple of key points that you want people to really take away and if they wanted to do a bit more digging after they've listened to the episode mm -hmm. where would you kind of focus their efforts so i think uh, quick win and i've said it like several times and, and we've talked about it is, is security center like if you haven't been using it already go there and even if you don't turn it onto the standard tier, have a look at the recommendations that are there now because you're going to get a whole heap of them for free anyway. So go there, start using that. That's going to give you insight that you've, like I said, you've probably never had before. And that's really the quickest one you can get. Um, the next thing I, I can't probably stress enough is uh, from that security perspective is have a look at what your identity structure is and what your identity strategy is for the cloud because your on-prem stuff probably doesn't really map it's way more dynamic in the cloud. And we've talked about the fact that you're exposed and on the internet now. Um, so make sure that, like we we're saying, that like that whole awareness and monitoring, like that you you know whose identity is being used and when and where and how. And I guess the, the other thing that we tell customers, number one, is turn MFA on as much, as, like for as many people as you can, ideally everybody, um, but pr predominantly like the quickest wins would be your privileged accounts, so your admins and then your VIP identities. And I know no one wants to go and tell their CEO that he needs to start two-factor authentication, but really those accounts, like I said before, like by virtue of his role, like he can have access to, or his or her uh, role, they can have access to whatever information they want really. 
So that really needs to be monitored and secured and, and hardened up. Uh, and then the rest of it is, is just like we were saying, like, is okay, like, let's iterate on this. If we're deploying with infrastructure as code, like how can we make it better next time? How can, what can we turn on to, to harden things up? Uh, and they're, they're really the key points and, and how I would leave customers from there. And then the bigger, broader conversations then start becoming about, you know, using policy to control your environment and management groups and all those sorts of things. But we could go for days talking about all this stuff. Excellent. And I think that's sounding like we need to do another episode. So uh, <laughs> until that time, Andrew, thank you so much for joining. I think it's been a super insightful session. It's been uh, a lot of fun to talk about security. And I know sometimes people might not think that it's a bit of a, you know, anti, uh, anti kind of pattern there of saying security is fun, but I've really enjoyed it. Um, and I think there's a lot that people are going to kind of learn there as well through, uh, through this session. So, Andrew, thank you for joining. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. Well, we had quite the journey there, didn't we? We've learned that like other aspects of building our solution, requirements are vital when designing security into your approach. That idea of failing to plan is planning to fail. Once we've begun threat modeling and have an idea of who and what our threats are, that's when we can begin working on security measures to reduce or mitigate that threat. There are Azure services that can help us have visibility into what is actually happening in our system. Azure Security Center has a wealth of features, including Secure Score, that can help us baseline and measure our progress. There's also Azure Sentinel, where we can ingest a number of data sources to help us see and stop threats before they cause harm. Finally, like most requirements, we learned that our security requirements will continue to adjust over time. Evolving your security operations into a wargaming style of working, where you have a red team which is trying to attack the system, and a blue team which is trying to detect or prevent attacks, is a modern extension of your security practice. Now don't forget to subscribe to and follow Cloud with Chris on your podcast streaming platform of choice, YouTube, and any social media channels that you use. We've left you with plenty to digest, so thank you once again for joining, and until next time, goodbye.